My name is Antonio Cavedoni. I am a type designer here in Italy, and I want to talk to you about Luca Pacioli and a little bit about art and science. And I'm talking about art with air quotes and science with air quotes. So uh, we look at um, uh, Luca Pacioli, his Divina Proporzione book, but also uh, we look at Roman capitals as constructed and drawn in the Renaissance in the 20th century. And then we'll look a little bit about uh, the developments in the 20th century in Italy. And lastly, we'll, again, look at art and science. Okay, so Luca Pacioli da Borgo San Sepolcro uh, was a man who lived in the full-on Renaissance between about 1445 to about uh, 1517. And he was from San Sepolcro, which is um, a small town literally in the middle of every town, uh, well, in the middle of everything, and also of very relevant uh, places for the Renaissance, like Urbino, uh, Roma, Bologna, Venezia, uh, where Luca um, studied uh, mathematics, and Milano, where he later uh, worked as well. Luca was a mathematician, he was a scholar, a teacher, and he was also um, a uh, friar of the Franciscani uh, order. But Luca was, more importantly, an author. Uh, he wrote the uh, Summa de Arithmetica, which is the, one of the early um, uh, treatises on arithmetics uh, in, the, in the Renaissance, um, and in it, it includes uh, a, tr a treatise on double entry bookkeeping, which is a system of keeping uh, sort of a, a, a accounts of, of business, which we still use to this day. Now, Luca is often credited with inventing uh, this or other things in his Summa, but actually he sort of compiled uh, knowledge that was um, uh, available at the time, and the double entry bookkeeping was, had been used already by the merchants at the time. But Luca was the first to put it in writing and to further it uh, for uh, our society. He wrote the Viribus Quantitatis, which includes uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, mathematic games, uh, early mathematic games uh, to, for teaching, uh, as teaching aids. He translated Euclidean elements into uh, Latin, he wrote uh, a treatise on chess, early uh, treatise on chess. And lastly, he wrote, uh, actually, lastly, he gave the name to this conference. Uh, little did he know, 500 years ago. Uh, so as you saw earlier uh, in Enrico's picture, this is Luca, and I'm not talking about the guy on the far right, which we actually don't know who it is, but the guy with the, uh, that looks like a, a friar. Um, it, the red book on the table is his Summa, and the other book is pointing with his finger is Euclid's um, uh, Elements. And uh, the shape uh, on the, um, uh, the, 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 what looks like a fish tank, uh, which it isn't, is actually a rhombi cuboctahedron, of course. Uh, so, the Divina Proporzione was uh, 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 one of his most famous uh, uh, books. It was published uh, originally as a manuscript in uh, 1498. Uh, there, were, there are three known copies of this manuscript, and this one, well, this is uh, a facsimile on the, on the floor of uh, my apartment, but uh, uh, the original one is in the Biblioteca uh, Ambrosiana in Milano, and it was originally dedicated to Galeazzo San Severino. Now, the title of the book, uh, as Enrico uh, mentioned previously, uh, refers to the um, uh, golden uh, ratio, which you can derive from this formula, and it was uh, essentially um, uh, uh, a way uh, to describe um, uh, in, in uh, well, it, it's a number that describes a relationship between uh, objects commonly found in nature. Uh, again, Luca did not invent this. Uh, this was known since uh, classic times, but Luca was kind of, um, uh, sort of showing it to the people of, of his own uh, time. Uh, his treatise includes uh, what to me, to my eyes, look like beautiful, beautiful illustration of Euclidean uh, solids. And his treatise is uh, mostly meant for uh, stonemasons, architects. Uh, it's a treatise on uh, geometry uh, and uh, um, uh, applied uh, geometry, essentially. So these solids are so stunning uh, that they have been credited to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, not just because they look so good, but also because Luca mentions him uh, in the book. Although his attribution uh, to these particular drawings is uh, uh, questionable, it's been debated. But Luca and Leonardo did know each other for sure, because they both lived uh, in Milano in the 1490s, late 1490s. And uh, uh, Luca has been, is credited as being uh, Leonardo's math teacher. So um, his Divina Proporzione uh, was, I guess, a success because it was republished in uh, 1509 as a printed uh, book by Paganino Paganini in, uh, in Venice. Uh, the beautiful hand-drawn uh, solids got turned into, again, what to my eyes looked like beautiful woodcuts, I have to say. 
Um, but most importantly for us, the book includes um, a series of geometrically constructed uh, Roman capitals. Uh, uh, Luca uh, shows them uh, uh, this. He adds this section to the printed version. It was not there in the manuscript. And uh, there he has drawings and explanations on how to build uh, these caps. He says, I added them in the book just because I want to demonstrate uh, that you, you don't need, the only thing you need to make these caps are a, a straight edge and a compass. And he says, I took these shapes from uh, Roman, um, uh, the antiquity from the Romans. Now, Luca uh, wasn't the first to uh, come up with uh, geometrically constructed caps. He, pardon me, uh, before him, there was a man called Felice Feliciano in uh, uh, Verona, well, Verona, who in uh, um, 1463 uh, published a manuscript with um, uh, geometrically constructed um, caps, uh, which was the first uh, no one that we know of. Um, but then uh, in uh, 1480, uh, another man called Damiano da Moilus um, in Parma published a printed book, the first printed book that we know with geometrically constructed caps. Now, the description in the text of Moilus and Pacioli are fairly similar, and so it is possible that Pacioli did have access to a copy of Moilus's book. Um, and I think the design similarities, I, I, I chose this G because you can see the bottom uh, right corner uh, is sort of a characteristic of the Feliciano letters and the, and the Moilus ones. Um, it's possible that Moile and Feliciano knew each other. But there is a link between this man, and that is Leon Battista Alberti, uh, who was, uh, uh, like Luca, was a polymath. He was a Renaissance man, an architect, uh, um, a mathematician, an, ar an artist. And Luca is actually, um, uh, sorry, Leon Battista Alberti is known to, um, to have known both Luca and being a friend of Felice Feliciano. So did they know each other? Did they know of each other or of each other's work? We, we don't know. Uh, Leon Battista Alberti also uh, is, is one of the uh, important figures uh, in the Renaissance uh, for the rediscovery of Roman models, including their caps, uh, both in architecture um, and in just in lettering. So here, this is the facade of the Santa Maria Novella church in uh, Firenze, which is just outside the train station. Um, and uh, here he uses uh, letters that are um, sort of derived from um, uh, classic models. In other words, in the Renaissance, just like other uh, things uh, about uh, uh, classic times, Roman capitals were definitely in. So much so that not just Luca, um, uh, Felice Feliciano, but many other um, uh, calligraphers and, and um, uh, lettering uh, people um, uh, published copybooks with uh, geometrically constructed caps. Uh, in fact, some of them didn't and some of them, most of them actually uh, did. Of the ones that didn't, I would like to acknowledge especially one person. Uh, uh, that is Giovanni Francesco Cresci. Uh, Cresci was a calligrapher. He uh, lived in Rome. I think he was from Milano. And he uh, lived in Rome, worked for the Vatican um, uh, throughout his career. And in 1560, he published this book, uh, which is kind of a copy book, uh, an exemplar uh, book with alphabets. He explains his theory about how to make the chancery letter with what looks like a pointed pen, which is an innovation for its time. But um, for, more importantly for us, he actually talks about Roman caps. And he says uh, that there are people uh, around that are trying to build the, the Roman caps with uh, uh, compasses. And he says, these, these letters don't have any proportions and no grace. He says, I, um, uh, I would really urge you uh, to uh, let go in, in smoke <laughs> these vain reasons and, and false opinions, and then to um, uh, notice the perfect rules of the uh, uh, classic times, uh, which I'm going to show you in my uh, alphabet, which is <laughs> a pretty scathing um, uh, stance against you know, Pacioli and, and, and Feliciano and these guys. And then he uh, goes on and shows you what his caps actually look like. Uh, beautifully um, uh, cut uh, in, in wood and printed lightly so you could actually see very well the, the impression of the letters. Um, Kerichi essentially says you can use your compass if you want to take measures uh, to reproduce this, but if you want to draw these caps, the only thing you need to do is patience. Uh, look at them, draw them over and over and over again, and eventually you will be able to make them. This is sort of uh, Kreshi's uh, rule. So 
fast forward to, uh, we're skipping basically uh, all the history of typography, uh, and we're getting to the 20th century. Unfortunately, we only have half an hour. Um, but I want to talk about some people that, uh, uh, at least to me, were a, a little known until um, uh, a few years ago, uh, that waited in, in this, on this um, topic of Roman caps. The first one I want to talk about is uh, a man called Walter Kech. Uh, here, uh, Walter uh, is taking a rubbing of an inscription. Uh, I think he's in Bologna. And uh, you take a rubbing by taking a piece of paper, sticking it on top of an of a, uh, inscription which has a letter engraved in it, and rubbing chalk or, or wax um, on it to take a, kind of a, a negative impression of it. So Walter was a calligrapher, a lettering artist. He designed um, uh, typefaces. And uh, he famously taught calligraphy uh, to Adrian Frutiger, which you may be familiar with. In uh, uh, 1956, he published a book called Rhythm and Proportion in Lettering, uh, in which, as you can probably tell from the cover, uh, he uh, relates the proportions of letters to the proportion of the human body uh, in a very sort of Renaissance um, uh, way, I, I would say. Uh, but then he says that, uh, you know, when these people in the Renaissance tried to build the caps with the um, uh, uh, ruling, uh, compass and ruling pen, they, they were doing it as if the laws of structure could give to that matter the living beauty of lettering. He says that the mistakes that these people made awry, uh, have arisen, which have acquired an appearance of truth through the very antiquity. And then he goes on uh, proclaiming that, you know, the... the the constructed caps and the geometrically constructed letters in general are just wrong and false, and the right way to make them is with writing instruments and with organic shapes, with organic curves. Um, you know, the unhappy measuring of things on the basis of technical science is no bueno in uh, sorry, in Kech, uh, um, uh, world. But interestingly, uh, he then publishes uh, a series of caps that you can use kind of uh, to uh, train your, uh, your eyes. And uh, there's two things interesting about these caps. The first one is that they're actually not based on models uh, from the Trajan column, which uh, Kreishi and the other people sort of acknowledge as being their source. But Kech goes, wrong, goes back to the first century caps, which are slightly more free and, and, and um, uh, you could almost say informal uh, in a way, at least to my eyes. But they're really, really nice as well. And then uh, in the um, graphs, uh, the charts that he uses to describe these, um, he actually uses the golden section. He uses the divine proportion uh, that, that Luca actually did not use in his letters. His book is about divine proportion, but his letters are not built according to it. They're just built with you know, straight lines and, um, and compass. But Kech's actually are. And so it's kind of strange because on the one hand, you know, he's criticizing the, the dramatic approach, but on the other hand, he's actually embracing it uh, to a certain extent. The other person I want to talk about uh, uh, is a man called Edward Kadich, uh, often known as Father Edward Kadich because he was a, a priest. Uh, he was trained as a sign painter in uh, Chicago, and uh, he uh, lived in Rome for a long time in the 50s and 60s. And uh, when he was in Rome, here he is on a scaffolding, taking a, a rubbing again of the Trajan, uh, lettering of the Trajan column, which I think today, if you try to do this, you'd probably be shot. Uh, but no, I mean, of course he had a <laughs> permit. But it, it, there's a scaffolding where he's uh, uh, sitting on. And uh, by doing this analysis, and with his background as a sign painter, he looked really closely, uh, really close up at these letters. This um, uh, particular image is from a rubbing that he took which I happened to see um, in San Francisco in the public library. Um, so Kadich figured out uh, in his way how these letters were put together and put forward his theory in uh, 1968 in a book called The Origin of the Serif. He talks about, um, you know, uh, he's, uh, at some point he talks about the um, uh, Renaissance letters, and he says that the attempts of these people uh, were understandable because free, true brush writing and the, the mastery of it were not known. He said that if people had known the vital practice of, uh, of brush writing in the Renaissance, um, they wouldn't have uh, published this uh, sort of compass and ruler lettering schemes. And, and then he says uh, that you just have to look at these caps to understand that they you know, have nothing to do with the Roman letters. He then shows you his version of the Trajan letters uh, built with a flat brush, which, you know, to me looks stunningly uh, beautiful um, and, and actually quite compelling as an argument for, for the brush-written uh, uh, 
structure of them. But one thing that is missing here is any sort of idea of proportion. As a matter of fact, I don't think he uses the word proportion once in the whole book. It's, it's a pretty thick book. Um, nor does he give uh, measurements for anything. He just says, you know, look, take a brush, look at these models, do the letters, you're done. Uh, later on, uh, in 1972, he actually published another um, uh, book. It's actually uh, two books. One is uh, the uh, captions, the other one is the uh, tables that you'll see in a second. And, uh, and in, in it, he starts actually by show, giving you some proportions, a skeletal alphabet, some idea of proportions. And he says, these are sort of the ideal letters. You can use this proportion that he derived from the Trajan column to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, you know, the, the relative weights of letters um, according to one another, and, uh, and uh, let's start from there. Now, another man I want to mention uh, in this uh, uh, almost debate uh, uh, about Roman caps is Donald, Donald Knut. Uh, Knut is actually a, a living, still living uh, legend in the world of computer science. Uh, he's a mathematician, uh, computer scientist. Uh, he is a, a great organ uh, player, um, and uh, he is also uh, interested in calligraphy and uh, and uh, lettering arts in general. And um, uh, Knut, in uh, 1999, published this uh, collection of essays um, that kind of recaps his whole uh, work about typefaces and uh, and uh, and typography. He is. Uh, uh, I have to say, Knut, to me, is a giant upon whose shoulder we all uh, stand, uh, at least in my profession as, as type designers. But anyway, in one of these essays, um, uh, Knut actually goes back to uh, an alphabet, a geometrical alphabet published by Torniello in 1517, and he goes about reproducing it with the aid of computers, so with formula and, uh, and, uh, and programs. Uh, and he starts and you know tries to figure it out and understands that actually the model that Torniello uh, did is not so accurate as he was uh, thinking. So he tries to kind of fix it and 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 get to nice shapes. But then he writes something that I found. Uh, I want to pass on to you because I found so uh, profound. He says that in the case of letter design, we don't merely want to take a particular drawing and come up with some mathematics to describe it. We really want to find the principles underlying the drawing so that we can gener generate indefinitely many variants, many drawings, including the given one, as a function of appropriate parameters. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, I went uh, Because Knut didn't just actually write this, but he actually implemented it in a system called Metafont, uh, which is a, essentially a system to build typefaces as uh, complex um, uh, systems. On, on the, in this one page from uh, his computer modern, um, uh, it's, it's about his computer modern fonts, he shows you a program on the right hand side and then he shows you the output with many different variants uh, of the same program. So you can, with some rules, you, can, you cannot just copy a model but you can also make variants of it programmatically. Uh, and so he starts, I think he's the, can be credited with the, the present day idea that type design is redesigning systems. Now, I would like to acknowledge uh, a few other people. We don't have time to look into their work, but they did all of them, and this is again a partial list. They all of them published uh, uh, exemplary models for Roman caps uh, in one way or another, and um, because they're capitals, most of these people are from the lettering world or the stone cutting world, uh, the calligraphy uh, world, but of course there's, there's many others. Okay, fast forward to uh, Italy. Um, there's this man called Alberto Libera, who uh, lived in, uh, well, in 1938, uh, he got commissioned uh, to um, uh, publish a manual about how to draw letters. Libera was a pretty well-known architect at his time of the rationalist uh, uh, sort of school of thought. And uh, uh, he got commissioned this alphabet because his commissioner, uh, Vincenzo Buronzo, says, that the quality of lettering is going uh, downhill, and now you know uh, the letters that we see around us are not um, uh, of good quality anymore. And he says the creation of an alphabet is an architectonic fact of primary importance that not everybody can actually um, confront with. He says the problem is beyond, uh, and it was and is beyond the possibilities of the craftsman uh, lettering artist, which he calls letterista. And then he says, uh, to fix this problem, it was indispensable uh, the advice and assistance of his uh, 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 
bigger brother and more expert brother, which is the architect. And so what is uh, uh, Libera's solution for you know, re rectifying this uh, um, decline in letter design? Constructed caps. Uh, uh, he actually reproduced with uh, uh, charts and measurements alphabets that weren't actually taken from uh, Roman models um, at all, but were taken from typefaces from either Nebbiolo or the Raimondi and Zucca uh, foundry. Uh, which are actually, I, th I think some of them are, are, are pretty nice. Um, he, the, the, the closest thing he does to showing you classical letters is this alphabet, which he calls Aldino, but it's actually kind of a Bodoni, uh, similar to Bodoni um, uh, sort of design. Another man I want to talk about is Luigi Astori, who in 1961, uh, together with uh, Giuseppe Pelliteri, published um, in the uh, magazine Coordinamento Grafico, which got, would then rebound in this uh, binder that I have, uh, a series of geometrically constructed uh, alphabets for, uh, as teaching aids. Uh, Pelliteri in his foreword says that, uh, sort of like uh, Libera, the decline, uh, there's a decline in letter design, not many people can draw letters very well, and he says if you want to teach um, uh, students how to draw letters, uh, the discipline that they can acquire by using a system of proportions and geometrical schemes, uh, it would be a nice foundation that they can build upon when they start drawing freehand. And he says that their system is different from the other ones because it's more comprehensive. Uh, he starts by building up a grid, and then the grid gets more and more complex uh, until he starts actually deriving letters uh, from it. Uh, I'm not so sure about the S there. Uh, I think the spine is slightly on the stiff side. But actually, I find some of the drawings quite, uh, quite nice uh, in their own right. One thing to notice is that uh, some of these um, letters aren't actually uh, pieces of lettering, but they are taken from typefaces. This particular one is taken from um, a typeface uh, from Aldo Novarese called uh, Garaldus. And you can see that the grid on the left-hand side is different from the uppercase than it is for the uh, lowercase. Most importantly, uh, the same grid can be used for all the letters. So once you've drawn it, you can put it on tracing paper and then draw the letters on top of it. So we just mentioned Aldo Novarese, and uh, you know, he, of course, is a towering figure, a uh, really serious man uh, from the looks of it. Uh, in, in, the, in 20th century type design, um, he himself published a book about um, how to draw letters, essentially, the, the drawing of letters and typefaces, which is called Alphabeta uh, from 1964. And uh, in it, he says, you know, if you want to start drawing letters, uh, if you're not familiar with the norms of uh, proportions, this, drawing an alphabet is not actually really easy. Uh, there's no rules that you can sort of uh, use, apply. So he says, I'm going to give you some rough guidelines, and then I'm going to show you some typefaces, but they're not quite based on, on these guidelines. So he starts from these. Uh, as you can see, you know, the, the grid is pretty coarse. There's a five by five grid, um, actually six by six, something like that. Uh, and uh, he then goes on, uh, and he says, you know, okay, let's start with actual alphabets, and let's start from the Trajan, well, sorry, from the Roman um, uh, letter, from um, classic uh, lapidary letter. It says, you know, as is comprehensible, drawing letters is an art. Uh, um, and he it says, it's not possible to uh, trust and rely uh, completely on geometry. So he uh, shows you his exemplary lapidary uh, model, which is actually based on a typeface that he and Alessandro Butti designed called Augustea. Um, Later on in 1990, he published another book which is about his own uh, alphabets uh, and includes an, uh, a drawing, a constructed drawing of his Garaldus typeface, like the one that we saw earlier from Astori. Although his grid is, uh, again, pretty simplified. And, you know, to me, they almost look like the drawings that are on a grid, but they're, um, they're not derived from the grid, essentially. The grid is derived from the drawings. Now, one thing to say about Aldo is that he's most famous, not for this kind of stuff, but for these typefaces, like Estro, which I love this stuff, uh, the great display typefaces, things like Stop, another sort of semi-obsession of mine, and uh, his uh, eponymous typeface, uh, Novarese. Now, uh, these typefaces are very beautiful, and you can see they're tightly spaced, they look great when they're big, uh, but one thing to note is that when 
Aldo published his book, uh, Alpha Beta, he didn't actually use any of his typefaces, but he used the typefaces for another, from another foundry. Uh, he, the typefaces he used are uh, Simoncini Garamond and Simoncini Delia uh, in uh, the five and a half uh, points and 11 point sizes. Now, we don't have time today, unfortunately, to talk about Simoncini. And yeah, I do know that his chair is too low. Um, but uh, we are working, uh, Manuel, Elisa, and I, on an exhibition about him uh, in September of this year. So if you're interested uh, in his work, uh, st stay tuned. And now, we're almost done. So I have been collecting materials about constructed alphabets for a long time and didn't spend much time trying to figure out what I found so fascinating. I think it has to do with the concepts of art and science. And forgive me here because I talk about them in the broadest, most loose way uh, possible. Um, in art, we can put the handmade, the organic, the intuitive, the beautifully imperfect, and all that. And in science, we can put the mathematical, the logical, the engineered, the reprodu reproducible. I think some of the people working on exemplar alphabets have sometimes framed their arguments as some sort of an either or situation. You either believe that geometry is true and the hand is false, or you believe that organic is beautiful and that machine is artificial, synthetic, and therefore ugly. And honestly, I find that overly restrictive. I think you know, the whole premise that I have to choose between art and science, for me, uh, personally, is a bit too much. I don't think it's a dilemma. I think uh, beauty is, can be found in both disciplines. Uh, they share a lot of the vocabulary. You know, when people talk about computer scientists, uh, talk about their algorithms, they talk about elegant algorithms or beautiful, just as much as artists uh, do about their own work. I find beauty in these drawings, both as drawings and also as sort of, uh, pro well proportioned caps, uh, as much as I can find them in, um, in uh, these ones from, from Cadiz that we saw earlier. I found these you know, just as stunning, but I don't want to have to choose. Because I think both approaches actually have pretty uh, uh, strong limitations, pretty obvious ones. You can find uh, geometry <laughs> in anything, uh, of course. And on the other hand, you can also run the risk. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you can run the risk of drawing beautiful shapes, which are not um, as versatile as they could be, because you're overlooking uh, the sense of scale. I think the concept of scale in lettering is fundamental. And it's a stimulus for a lot of the constructed alphabets that we saw earlier. People wanted to make bigger letters than they could with their arms and hands. Um, but what a lot of them missed is the idea that shapes that work at one size don't necessarily work for others. And adjusting letters for the distance, scale, viewing conditions that they will be read at is a primary concern, at least to us as lettering uh, people. Uh, neither uh, Libera or Astori address this. And Katic talks about an, an ideal uh, letter size for Roman uh, caps, uh, which is the one that you can do with a flat brush of specific size. Um, uh, but Cresci actually does mention in his treatise uh, the, the notion of scale and adjusting letters depending on where they're going to be put uh, compared to the uh, viewer's um, eyes. And probably Knut treat them as parameters. So you just you know, add an uh, optical size uh, uh, function to his typefaces. Uh, I think how you get to a set of shape isn't necessarily the most important thing. Uh, it's what you make of them. Uh, you draw uh, also with your eyes, I think. And to the viewer, I'm not sure it matters if a, shame, if a shape comes from a chisel, a brush, a pen, a hand, or anything else. I mean, is the shape any good? I think you can trick people into thinking that your letters are carefully constructed with seemingly precise angles and distances, but you can't fool their eyes which don't necessarily care about regularity all the time. But I think when you uh, judge with your eyes, you also need to see through results that aren't necessarily where you'd want them to be just yet, if you think the principles behind your ideas are, are sound. Of course, you know, a uh, critical uh, concept is evaluate, e evaluation, how to uh, know whether what you're doing is any good. And as a designer and user of letters, I try to go by these two principles. The first one is fitness for purpose. Do the letters I'm using work for what I want them to be used for? And the second one is voice. Do the letters that I'm using have the right uh, voice? Do they speak in the right tone? Now, I showed you earlier a rubbing of the Trajan column. This is a bigger version of it. And 
I mean, I love these letters. Uh, they're, they're great examples of, you know, a, a letter that was both uh, had fit for purpose, you know, the, the purpose was engraving into marble uh, on lapidary inscription, but it was also to convey to people uh, messages from the Roman Empire. And uh, uh, the voice of them uh, and the function of them is, is perfect for this one specific use, um, but it's hardly everything we need nowadays. So th while these letters, I think, are uh, and definitely, definitely an apex, you know, they have, their importance is with us uh, 2,000 years later, I would like to see them as not so much as a summit, something we reach and we can't go further, but as a trampoline that we can sort of stand on and go even further. And I'm talking, not talking about myself personally, but ourselves as, as mankind. There is a whole world of expressive, uh, nice shapes um, that is waiting for, to be discovered uh, by us. I think tools that help speed this discovery, such as programs, are really important, um, I think. And just as it's important to keep looking at the past, figure out what's good and why it is actually good, so that we can figure out what's gonna be next. I think dogma will not help uh, us getting there, uh, to be honest. And not, nor will walls you know, between disciplines or, or, or people. I think that's not the way to go uh, about it. I think art and science are not adversaries. I think they're both tools, just as the brush, the chisel, the pen, the computer, the human hand, and even the human eye are tools. And when evaluating tools, I like to think of them in terms of what they will allow me to do rather than what they will prevent me from doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, the bibliography on this topic is vast. I mean, it's, it's as wide as the history of writing, so I couldn't possibly put all the books that I consulted on this. I just wanted to acknowledge, sorry, let me go back, uh, a few people uh, fundamental for this, uh, uh, at least for this talk, which are uh, James Mosley and his research on the uh, revi revival of the uh, Trajan letter in the Renaissance, uh, Father Kadich uh, and his uh, decoding of the Trajan letters, um, Stanley Morrison and his writings about uh, Pacioli, but just lettering in general. Uh, he, there's actually a book uh, that Morrison wrote and Bruce Rogers designed about Pacioli. If you can find it, it's great. I think Glenn actually may have a copy. Um, uh, and then many other people, including Don Knut, uh, uh, Giovanni Mardesteig. I would like to thank these institutions for allowing me to use some of their uh, pictures. Uh, and also these people for bearing with me as I was preparing this. Uh, most importantly, I would like to thank you for uh, sitting through all of this. Thank you very much.